My name is Jason Euler. Uh, I'm based out of Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States. I work for a company called Relentless Beats. Uh, we're the largest concert and festival producer here in the Southwest. Uh, we average a little over 275 shows annually, and we'll draw anywhere from 275 to over 300,000 attendees across those shows annually. Uh, I wear a number of hats here. Uh, I work in sponsorships primarily. Uh, I negotiate all the brand deals that go into the events, whether it be liquor sponsorships, automotive, credit card. Um, and then I take those funds from the sponsors and I create experiences inside the events. I curate everything down to art installations, brand activations, um, characters and immersive experiences. Really everything that makes the music festival so much more than just the music. Um, and I've been here for about two and a half years now. I went to my first music festival in September 2016, which was Mad Decent Block Party, which was a Relentless Beats event. Um, I'd, I'd never been to a dance music festival before. Uh, I wasn't too familiar with the culture. Um, I had some friends that wanted to drag me to it, uh, and I was very hesitant to go, to be quite frank. Uh, it was a two-day festival, and I ended up going night one, had a good time. And then uh, you know, I said, okay, I'll give it another shot. I went back night two, and night two, I just had the absolute best night of my life. Um, I had so much fun that I got separated from my friends. I was walking around the festival, talking to strangers, just getting immersed in the experience. Um, and my friends thought I had left. Um, so my phone died and my friends ended up leaving the festival. Um, and I was there stuck stranded by myself. And uh, I ended up paying $150 to get home in an Uber that night. And uh, I was 23 years old and fresh out of college at the time, so uh, funds weren't too great. And uh, that charge wasn't too, too nice. So the following festival I went to, Global 2016 in November, um, I rented a party bus. Uh, the bus held about 60 passengers, but I only thought I'd get about 30 friends to come on board. Um, so I ended up just inviting a bunch of people on the party bus. We ended up having 75 people on the bus. Um, I made probably a little over $2,000 to $3,000 in a week there. And my goal was to not make, I wasn't trying to make money off my friends. I was just trying to avoid paying $150 for an Uber again. And uh, I didn't want to Venmo everyone back because it would have taken forever. So I donated the money to Phoenix Children's Hospital. And uh, I posted the receipt in the group and said, here's what I'm doing. If you have an issue, let me know. Everyone was really cool with it. And uh, that night after Global Dance Festival, I saw a few acts, Galantis in particular, um, which just, I left the festival going, oh my God, I love this. How do I turn this into my job? And I just knew right then and there I wanted to work in the music industry. Uh, the last passenger to come off the party bus that night when we got home goes, what about the party buses for decadence? And that was the next festival coming up in Arizona and the light bulb went off. Um, so I ran two party buses to decadence. Uh, I went on to run party buses for almost an entire year. Uh, party buses led to doing bottle service at nightclubs. We started doing club takeovers, um, all the way up to doing a 4,000 person block party on Mill Avenue uh, here in Arizona. And uh, by 2019, I had been acquired by Relentless Beats and uh, that was in February and I've been on the team there since. Um, so I started with about $500 in a party bus as I always tell everyone. <laughs> Uh, again, Relentless Beats, largest concert and festival promoter in the, uh, in the Southwest United States here. Um, we do everything from 200 person room club shows all the way up to festivals that will draw upwards of 25,000 people a day. Um, work with a lot of the major names in dance music, whether it be the Skrillexes of the world, Elenium, Above and Beyond, um, you name it. Uh, my CEO, Thomas Turner, started Relentless Beats back in 1996. Uh, just throwing parties in the desert out here in Arizona. And as dance music really gained its popularity in the United States, um, Thomas really just kind of rode that momentum and really developed Relentless Beats into what you see it is today. Um, so right now, just even in the short term, I'm, I'm working on a three-day music festival with the team called Gold Rush Music Festival. Um, it's here in, here in Arizona and Phoenix. Uh, we'll have over 60 uh, international and national touring artists and about another 70 local artists from around the region here. Um, and we're expecting upwards of 15 to 20,000 a day at that festival this year. Absolutely. Um, you know, we work with a lot of agents. Uh, my CEO, again, starting throwing parties in 1996. You know, he was making offers for Skrillex back in the early 2000s before Skrillex even started to release big tracks. Um, he was working with Porter Robinson before Porter Robinson was really, you know, blowing up. 
Um, so as he came up, he really developed a lot of relationships with these agencies and these agents in particular as they were really coming up for their career. Um, you know, so now you look at that, it's almost a 20 year relationship um, that he's worked and helped build these careers of artists in this market um, and, and vice versa with the agents giving him artists to build his company here in the market. Um, so that was a long standing relationship. Uh, prior to working at Relentless Beats, I had to go and figure out how to talent buy in the market um, against that, which was uh, a really difficult uh, journey, um, you know, and primarily as a promoter, you're really only working with the agent most times, um, unless the artist does not have an agent, which there are a number that still don't, in which case you would go work with the manager. Um, but basically, you know, we're taking offers to the agent, agency goes back to the manager, manager goes to the artist, uh, you know, their team decides that they want to play the event, if it's a good fit for the career, if the fee, if the fee is right. Um, and then they take it back to the agent who eventually negotiates the final deal with the promoter. Um, so I had to work with a number of agents coming up where I didn't have much of a relationship. Um, I really had to build myself through a lot of local events and prove and, you know, I had footage and video of, hey, look at this event we just did. You know, we had so many people, this many people out. And once agents were seeing that, okay, he was pulling, you know, a crowd in with local artists. Um, once you kind of establish that, you know, that consistency and that presentation of your company, um, you know, you'll finally get an agent that takes a chance on you. Um, first agent that took a chance on me was Leo Corson uh, when he was with APA Agency, which is a massive agency here in North America. Um, and he was the first guy to let me book some big name touring acts and come play my show. Uh, and that was for a block party I did in 2018. Yeah, um, so like I said, you know, I, I ran one party bus, um, word got out, hey, you know, you can get a round trip party bus for $20, you can drink on the bus, you can dance with your friends. Um, and it was a really viable way to travel to the festival. Um, the festival grounds were about 30 minutes from the epicenter of the city. Um, so Ubers were just super expensive, so you know, all I did was come up with a solution when I started doing the party buses and it, it turned out a lot of other people needed that same solution. Um, and then from that solution, we really built a community. Um, as I mentioned on the first party bus I did, we donated proceeds to Phoenix Children's Hospital. Um, we went on to donate a portion of the proceeds from every single party bus or event we did for the next two and a half years to a different nonprofit charity uh, in the Valley here in Phoenix. Uh, so I would partner with a different nonprofit we would promote the nonprofit in conjunction with the show. Uh, my team would even get out and we'd go volunteer for the nonprofit here. And uh, then we'd donate a portion of the proceeds after the party bus, after the show, uh, whatever it might be. So a community really built around that idea. And that's what really gave the company steam to scale. And it went from one party bus to two party buses to we were running upwards of four or five party buses, um, you know, with hundreds of passengers to the, fa to the festivals. Um, you know, same thing when we broke into the nightclubs, you know, I would go in and say, Hey, I will have two tables filled here right when doors open. Um, and we'd bring the party bus community out. Um, and then eventually the DJs who would, uh, DJ the pre games for the party bus, they eventually started getting to DJ the opening slots at the clubs. Um, so even acts like I work with now Econova, you know, we were putting them on opening slots at 10 o'clock at doors. Um, and I'd fill a few tables. And uh, we just kept scaling and scaling. More people came to the buses, more people came to the tables. And uh, you know, one day we kind of sat down and talked with the team and said, why don't, why don't we throw our own show? Uh, we threw our own show on my 25th birthday, uh, December 7th, 2017 uh, at Shady Park, which is just a, a world renowned venue here in Arizona, very beloved. And uh, we sold it out on a Thursday night and that was our first show. And then the ball really just rolled from there. It was my second festival. I, I'd always had a knack for doing events. Um, even in high school, um, I threw a dance in competition with my school's dance just cause the school's dance played horrible music. They were really strict and the kids didn't want to go. Uh, so I created an alternative solution and I threw my own dance. Um, and I had hundreds of kids show up to my dance and only a few showed up to the school's dance actually and I was only 18 at the time. Um, so I kind of had event planning in my blood a little bit, um, but I was an athlete at the time and uh, I was playing baseball in college and slightly in the professional ranks. And, um, you know, baseball came to an end. I came back to Arizona and I got a corporate job. I worked a nine to five in a call center in sales. And uh, I was working there when I went to my first festival. And then uh, after my second festival, again, I, I 
saw the performance that night. Um, I saw some acts and just the music just completely took over and I just, I fell in love with it. And, and that night when I walked out of the gates of the festival, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work in this industry. Um, to fast forward, you know, uh, two year, two and a half years from that moment and be working for the company of the event I went to. And, you know, now I'm working in those same festivals, coming up with ideas, um, creating experiences for the audience. And, you know, I'm creating things that I always dreamt about when I was there as a fan. Um, so it's really humbling. Uh, but yeah, I, I knew after that second festival and I just never looked back after that. Absolutely. Starting a tour is very difficult, um, you know, and it just takes years of one. You got to go play a lot of different markets and really build yourself in those markets. Um, you know, as a manager with my artists, I look to get them to play strong support slots from very established artists. Um, you know, if I can find a direct support slot in the market like Los Angeles, Las Vegas, um, San Diego, you know, anywhere here, um, I'll send my artists to go play and we just start building, you know, some some familiarity in those areas. Um, you start building relationships with the promoters there. Um, you know, in order to have a tour, you got to become a hard ticket selling act, uh, which means you need to be able to go and sell 300, 400, 500 tickets minimum just for your name and your brand um, for a tour to really be viable. And you got to be able to do that in multiple markets, uh, which is extremely difficult. So it takes a long time of really building the ranks, building yourself in the market. You know, you might need to go play Los Angeles four or five times before you even become a hard ticket selling act there, sometimes more. Um, but, you know, for building a tour, you know, uh, if you're working with an agency or, you know, just a manager, you know, you, you come up with a, a pitch deck essentially um, and you go to a variety of promoters and say, hey, we're putting a tour together. Um, this is why our act can be valuable to your brand in the market. Um, we're going to put this amount of money into the marketing to really make sure we have presence and we're getting the word out. Here's how we're going to work with you as the promoter to make sure we sell hard tickets to your event. And you really got to paint that picture of how it's going to work because at the end of the day, the promoter's investing their own money and they're taking a risk on you, uh, no matter which way you slice it. So you really got to come with a strong plan of, Hey, this is how we're going to get, get a crowd and an audience in there. Relentless Beats has, has a number of brands. Uh, the two main ones you see, obviously the main umbrella, as I call it, which is Relentless Beats as a whole. Um, we have another brand called RB Deep, um, which really stemmed from my CEO's love of, of house and techno music um, and really just that underground style of music that really brought dance music to the mainstream. But, you know, going back to the roots. Um, so RB Deep's a, a very big focus of ours and something we're really passionate about because it, it's really my CEO's just love of the origins of dance music. Um, you know, then we have our other brands, you know, Gold Rush, our music festival, that's its own brand. Um, it has its own social media account, you know, its own identity. Uh, same with Decadence, our New Year's Eve festival, um, where we'll drop, you know, 20, 25,000 people a day. Um, so each festival and brand really has its own voice. Um, so how we communicate to our audience is very different off each platform. Um, but we like to have the festivals to have their own identity so people can, you know, really connect with those festivals as well as just Relentless Beats as a whole. Um, and, and across those, we've, we've really built a number, I think we're at about seven or eight different festival brands, uh, really scaled across the company. And then, you know, even with RB Deep uh, 2018, we did our first uh, RB Deep festival, which was called Origins, um, really pertaining back to the origins of underground dance music and really trying to curate a lineup that fits that culture. Yeah, we, we curate lineups for every subgenre of dance music, um, even Relentless Beats as a whole. We've, we've even moved outside of dance music to where we're doing reggae. We've done hip hop. Uh, we have a multi-genre music festival called Dusk. We now are a co-promoter of. Uh, so we really curate to just not just dance music, you know, dance music will always be our, our bread and butter. It's where we started. It's where we came from. Um, and Relentless Beats has really evolved into a, a music hub as a whole um, in, in the Southwest here now. There's always a bigger fish in the pond. Um, no matter what level of the music industry you're at, I guess, unless you're at the big corporate giant, uh, um, there's always a bigger fish. Uh, when I was running Octave, my first company, which did the party buses, the tables, and the smaller shows, um, I was throwing uh, events the same night Relentless Beats might throw a show. And I had to get really creative on how I did it, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have an audience at my event. Um, so if Relentless Beats threw a dubstep show, we would throw a house show. If they threw a house show, we'd throw a dubstep show. Um, 
you know? And the one thing I started to realize is Relentless Beats had so many relationships because obviously my CEO has been working with these agents for 20 plus years. Um, and I was the new kid on the block. I didn't have a ton of track record or history. Uh, I hadn't worked with a ton of agents. I had minimal experience. Uh, it wasn't even my full-time job. I was still working at a nine to five call center sales job. Um, so I had to get really creative. And what I started doing was I would go to other markets and find promoters who were my size and say, hey, why don't we all book the same artist? We'll negotiate a, a bulk rate uh, with the agent and we'll go and offer him six different cities. Um, you know, Relentless Beats was able to offer multiple shows a year. They were able to offer festival bookings. And, and I didn't have those things to offer value or create leverage with the agent. Um, so being the smaller guy, I pivoted and I could move quicker than the bigger guy could at the time. So that was how I came up with that way to get around, um, you know, some of the difficulties I was having in booking, you know, big talented names. Um, you know, fast forward to getting to Relentless Beats, you know, I, I go on to join the team where I had to compete against at one point. And even now, you know, you deal with radius clauses, um, you know, with major music festivals, you know, um, EDC or Coachella or any of these big major festivals you see, they all have radius clauses on the artist saying the artist can't play a show within 400 or 500 miles of the event. Um, so sometimes you either have to buy out that radius clause or, um, you know, negotiate something to, to make it okay for the artist to come play your market. Um, so those radius clauses make it really difficult um, for certain markets to get certain acts because, you know, one, you're already paying the artist fee, but then sometimes you got to go pay another fee just in radius clauses. Um, and with how risky, you know, throwing an event is, you know, all, all those radius clauses, they add up. Um, so that, that's one way that's made it really tough to compete in the market. Um, but getting past it, it's just about developing value to your customer base, your audience and giving them a consistent product. Um, you know, Relentless Beats time and time again, we've been able to give consistent festivals, consistent shows and consistent value by creating great experiences for our audience. Um, and, and when you can do that on a local level here in the state, as we've grown up through the state, um, you build a relationship with that audience and a relationship with that, that attendee. Um, and I think that's what separates us from the bigger giant corporations. You know, they're so national and global that it's hard for them to develop a relationship with the attendee um, and, and give them consistent value. You know, we're here in Arizona 365 days a year. So we're constantly thinking, how do we give value to Arizona and to the attendees that are coming to our events? <laughs> So we don't produce the whole tour ourselves. We just, you know, we curate markets. Um, you know, like we work in El Paso, Texas, Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, Flagstaff, Tucson, and Phoenix, Arizona are some of the primary markets we work in. Um, you know, so sometimes a tour will come and we'll say, hey, we'll do Albuquerque, Flagstaff, Tucson, Phoenix, uh, and El Paso, and we can offer five dates. Um, but the agencies are going to really be the ones who are going to build that tour for the act. You know, they're going to go to Florida, they're going to go to Texas, California, and really get, you know, Insomniac, Disco Donnie, and a lot of the other big name promoters to buy onto that tour and, and host it as well. Um, so we play a small part in the tour. Um, that's really handled at an agency and manager level with the artists. Um, now on the other side, as I am an artist manager, um, you know, I'll either work with our agent or I'll work directly with my artist to go build our own tours. And, and at that point, again, I'm creating those pitch decks. I'm coming up with, uh, value adds and leverage of how we're going to create, you know, a hard ticket sale in that market for that promoter. I, I don't think we'll get to the point where we're going to go focus on producing tours for the artists. Um, I know we are expanding into other markets. Uh, we're looking for new opportunities just to connect with uh, lovers of dance music and lovers of music in general. Um, you know, we're looking for areas where we can throw a unique event that's going to be a really great experience for the audience. Um, so I do expect us to see us grow in some new markets and continue to expand. Uh, I don't see Relentless Beats at this moment, you know, and who knows, things could always change. Uh, I don't see, I don't expect to see us expand into the point where we're gonna go and host an entire tour. Um, you're gonna see that primarily happening again, more on the agency side or the big conglomerate side of, of big corporate event giants. Um, for me, number one, uh, the music. Uh, at, at the end of the day, that has to be the foundation of every artist. Uh, the, the thing that separates great artists from good artists is, is simply their, their, either their music or their ability to really be good at branding. Um, and you know, coming, creating a brand without music is extremely difficult. There's a few exceptions out there, 
but more times than not, it comes down to the music. Are they a talented producer? Uh, you know, are, are a lot of people listening to their records? Um, you know, are, are their records getting signed to, to large labels and you're, you're seeing it get lots of reach to where people are going, wow, I need to go see this artist because they have such great music. Uh, that has to be the foundation of any successful project, plain and simple. Um, you know, from there though, then yeah, hey, what's their brandability? Um, you know, do they market a lot? Are they gonna help push tickets for the show? Are they gonna be actively engaging with fans on social media? Are they gonna be interacting with fans in Discord, TikTok, or Instagram? Uh, what's really gonna drive them to come see them when they come to our market? Um, you know, and then it's, it's just building history with the act. Um, even Relentless Beats here, you know, we'll bring an act when they're very small and they might play an opening slot. Uh, then they might come back the next time and play a direct support slot. Um, you know, and it might take two, three years before they come back and eventually we have them booked as a headliner. Um, you know, I've watched it time and time again. Uh, even when I was running my own entertainment company, um, I was able to book acts, you know, for very low fees while they were still building themselves. And now I'm watching some of those acts tour the globe, uh, play all over the country here and play some major festivals. Uh, and it's really just incredible to watch the journey of those artists. And, and as a promoter, you, you almost pride yourself on, on finding that artist and discovering their music to share with the audience uh, before they really blow up. And, and it's always a really cool feeling when you see that happen. Uh, marketing and just uh, promotion has changed so drastically over the last even two, three, four years that I've been around dance music heavily um, compared to like the, you know, right after 2010, 2012. Uh, you know, you look at a lot of the artists that were on Instagram in the early days before Instagram put in algorithms, before they had, you know, these paid advertisements, before it was just so saturated. These uh, uh, artists were able to build really big followings on these channels. Um, and now these channels are so diluted and you look at like the sound clouds of the world where it's just, it's a, there's so much music on there and there's, it's just so buried. Um, Instagram, it's just so buried, uh, with content nowadays too. And it's really now a thing you have to pay to be on it. Um, you know, I'm watching TikTok and watching songs blow up with artists putting $0 into TikTok, uh, because it caught a trend. It caught someone's attention. Uh, and the biggest shift you'll see in marketing and promotion right now is it's really getting more toward a grassroots marketing. You really need to figure out as an artist, how do I go and connect with one fan individually at a time almost? Um, if you can really connect with a fan and make them feel valued and you can show them who you are even beyond an artist, you know, it's one thing to be a great artist, but even myself as a fan, I wanna support a great person. Um, so I really pay attention to the artists that are directly communicating with their fans, whether maybe they're in discord channels where they're speaking with a number of, uh, their audience in there, you know, they're on Twitter jumping in conversations with these kids. They take the time to respond to a direct message and just share a little love with, with someone who appreciates them and their music. Uh, you know, I really think things are shifting to these new channels like discord, TikTok, because they are so much more community based. Uh, Instagram and Facebook just kind of seems saturated and, you know, overworked and you're not really truly able to connect with your audience as much on those platforms now. I think booking fees are out where they're at in North America. Um, you know, you got to look at the United States as a whole and just the history of the country, you know, entertainment has always just been such at the forefront here. Um, you know, whether it be Hollywood, um, you know, coming to life in the early 1900s, you know, our sports markets and how many diverse sports we have here that just draw huge entertainment crowds for entertainment um, and music's no exception to that. Um, you know, I think having things like Hollywood and having this pull for entertainment where, you know, a lot of the best athletes in the world come here to play sports. Um, a lot of musicians move here to be near the hub of, you know, being in a place where they can network and grow. Um, and I think the difference between North America and Europe is, you know, North America is really a, a business. You see like a lot of the big corporations just form out of here in any industry um, that just become these massive conglomerates and they really grow, I think, just based on the culture of our country. Um, you know, but you go look at like Asia, you know, I know my artists, if I, my artists I manage, if I send them to Asia, they're gonna get paid two to three times what they see here in North America, just one based on a bigger population. And, you know, um, there's a lot of economic 
uh, wealth in a lot of those areas too out there, um, you know, whether it be in Japan, China, and just some of these massive, massive markets where they have so many ears that they can reach. Uh, you know, just on a population scale, you're looking at, you know, billions, billions in Asia compared to even, you know, United States, where we're at like 330 million people here. So I think it's just that America consumes so much entertainment on a large scale, um, you know, that you really see the booking fees different. And yes, there, as far as sponsorships go, there's a lot more money put into these events. Um, a lot of brands are putting their names on the artists. Um, I work with brands to present them at our festivals too. Um, it's a little different. Those brands, we're not using that funding to go toward the artist, though. Um, we're really using that to enhance the experience at the festival and, you know, really include the brands and give them good activations uh, on site. Yeah, having the sponsorship definitely offsets the offsets the risk for sure. The festival and, um, you know, a lot of the big alcohol co like corporations here, you know, those are the people that are funding. Uh, you know, political campaigns and donating money to huge, huge like, corporations. You know, it's just, again, it's the culture of where, you know, the geopolitical aspect of what we are is. Yeah, artist management was really something I just kind of fell into, to be completely honest. I mean, I fell into entertainment as a whole. Um, you know, Ekanova, who is probably my, my, the artist I've worked with the longest, I think we're coming up on like four and a half years now. Um, you know, he was actually in a duo when I discovered him. And uh, we had met uh, on social media and, you know, he wanted to come play one of the pregames for my party bus. Um, and he was, you know, he was only, I think he was 18 or 19 at the time, very young kid. And uh, he sent me a SoundCloud link and just shared his music. And at that time, I was still so new to dance music. But even with how naive and, you know, how much I didn't know, I still was able to hear it and go, wow, that's really good music. Uh, so again, just number one thing it goes back to is, is the music good? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you can't, a manager's job is to essentially take that art and distribute and sell that art to the world and help grow that artist. And if the art isn't of quality, um, you know, one, people aren't going to buy into it. And two, you're going to have a much harder time getting that artist uh, recognized or noticed. So it really starts with, you know, is the music good? Uh, the next thing is just, you got to find an individual that, you know, are, are they a hard worker? What's their work ethic like? Um, I can't tell you how many talented individuals I've seen come and go that really didn't amount to enough because at the end of the day, talent isn't what carries you through. Um, it, it's passion, it's consistency, and it's being persistent. Uh, those are the qualities and some of the intangibles that you need to look for before taking on a project with an artist. Um, again, they can have all the talent in the world, but if they don't know how to work hard or you know stay consistent, you're gonna have a really hard time going anywhere. Um, it's a long, long process to grow an artist. Um, and so you gotta, you know, and passion is what's gonna carry you through when it gets really difficult. So find good music and find someone that has intangible skills like like passion, uh, you know, hard work, hard work, and just that mindset to grind because it, it's a long road. <laughs> Launching a project is very, very difficult. You know, you have to go from zero to one. Um, and the problem most artists make is they start trying to build the framework um, of their project before they've really built a good foundation. And by the framework, I mean, you know, I watch these kids, they go, they'll go try and play 20 local gigs instead of sitting in the studio for 100 hours and getting really good at their craft. They'll start merchandise stores before they've even built uh, an audience or a fan base. It's really like putting the cart before the horse. Um, when I talk about foundation, you really need to build what your brand and what your project is. What's the color scheme look like? What does the font look like? Um, what's the mood of, of the brand? What does the voice sound like on social media? Are they very excited and outspoken? Are they, is the brand more shy and reserved? Is the brand mysterious? Um, you, you see a lot of different artists and a lot of these artists kids follow, they've become really good at communicating a consistent message in conjunction with really great music. Um, you know, so I always think, you know, start with one, like any normal business should start. What's your mission statement? Why does your project exist? What about your music is going to make an impact or a difference in the world? Um, and then what does that look like? Um, and, and you really have to figure out those small immediate steps to coincide with the music as you go to launch a project. Um, you know, and, and just like a, a rocket ship taking off to outer space, the hardest part is the launch. It's getting through the atmosphere. You know, those ships have to burn twice as much fuel just to get to space than they burn the entire time they're up there. 
So you got to come out the, the gates with a plan. Um, a, a goal without a plan is a wish. So you need, to, you need to have a plan of exactly what your brand's gonna look like, what the music's gonna sound like, and how you're gonna be consistent. Um, and, and when I launched uh, the Econova project with him, we had a full plan. We knew what the music was gonna look like. We had a good stockpile of music to where we knew we were gonna be able to consistently release records. Um, we had a color scheme for the brand. Um, you know, we had the logos and fonts figured out. We had a mission statement of why we were doing what we were doing. Uh, and those are the things that get overlooked and they're really small things, but they make the biggest difference because when you're creating a brand, you need something that's going to consistently resonate within someone's mind. Um, you know, cause someone might see you one time and not fully remember you, but they might subliminally remember the brand or subconsciously, or they saw something and that's how you really drill it into someone's head until, you know, you're a household name or a well-known project. Yeah, as a manager, you really got to come and figure out, okay, there's so many different aspects that this artist needs. Um, you know, what are their needs? And then you really have to assess yourself as a manager and know what you're good at. Um, some managers are really organized. Some are really great at running advertising. Some managers know how to do video editing. Um, you know, whatever it might be. So for myself as a manager, I had to really take account what are the things I'm good at and I need to focus on those things. I'm a very organized manager. Um, I, I focus heavily on networking and building relationships and I'm, I'm able to do that at, at a high level and create opportunities for my artists that way. I don't know how to run Facebook ads. I know they're important and I know we need them, but I have no idea how to do that. So, you know, now I gotta go fill that hole in the boat or the ship's gonna sink. So then you go and find someone that can double, that is, you know, focused on that skill set and let them run that area of the project. Um, so when you're building a team, you just got to really be self-aware. That's the biggest key. And even as an artist, you need to be self-aware as an artist. What are your best strengths and focus on those and then find someone else with the strength that has strengths that you don't have and bring those people in on the project, whether it's finding a publicist, um, someone to do marketing on Facebook and Instagram ads, finding a videographer who's, who's a great video editor, um, you know, having a good graphic designer that can really take the image in your head and portray it to your audience. Um, you know, and there's a lot of artists, even like Ekanova, you know, he has, he can graphic design a little bit. He knows how to do some video editing. Um, you know, he has a few skills. So now it's okay. What do I plug in around him that he can't do and I can't do? Um, and we start bringing more people onto the team that way. Uh, getting started is the hardest part. And it's really just that it's starting. Um, everyone sits and comes up with a master plan of how they're going to do this and how they're going to come up with this. And then they just wait and wait and wait instead of getting started. Uh, the real secret is start before you're ready. Uh, you know, find opportunities to connect with people who are doing what you want to do. You might have to go message a hundred people on Instagram or Twitter or write a hundred emails. You might get one or two responses. Um, you know, you got to deal with being said no to a lot. Um, but the biggest goal is just to start. Once you start, then you can start dealing with the problems that come in, you know, that you're going to inherently face. And then you have to be creative enough to work your way around those hurdles. Um, you know, it could be something as simple as find a, find a blog and say, Hey, can I, can I write for you? Or, you know, go to a festival. Hey, I want to volunteer and set up and just get around it. Odds are you're going to meet someone within that organization. And if you're able to develop a relationship with them, you work hard and they like working with you. Another opportunity may open up. Um, you know, my journey was a little different where I actually had uh, applied to Relentless Beats to sell tickets and become a promoter and uh, my email had never gotten answered. So I took the party bus concept and I said, you know what, I'll go do this on my own and I'll, I'll make it my way. Um, I started with, again, I started with $500 and I had a business credit card. Uh, I would go to garage sales on Saturdays and Sundays and buy junk at the garage sales on they're really cheap and I would flip it on Facebook marketplace or offer up for a profit and I would help fund shows that way. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you want something, you will find a way. And if you don't, you will find an excuse. Um, you know, so the, the best advice is just to truly get started, 
find individuals you can connect with and just work really hard and find people you can go work hard with. Away, away, away. Yeah, the future of live music's drastically changed over the last year. Um, obviously, with what COVID and the pandemic did to our industry, uh, we had to get really creative. Um, you know, in Relentless Beats, we did just that. Uh, we were actually the first company in North America to host a drive-in uh, show where we had, you know, hundreds of cars all parked and we had them all spaced out um, to where people could come and see a show. Um, as the restrictions got loosened, we started doing pod shows and we were the first group in North America to do a pod show. Um, we had eight people to a pod and all pods were six feet apart and we were able to do thousands of attendees uh, at certain points during the pandemic uh, in that capacity. Um, in April here, the mask mandates lifted and everything you know, went up and in Arizona, at least, we've been relatively back to 100% normalcy um, to where our events are running just as normal as ever right now. And uh, you know, until the laws change or things like that, I, I assume they will continue to do so. And um, you know, we are taking extra precautions as far as, you know, the health and safety sanitization stations, um, you know, provide, making sure people are providing vaccination cards, uh, you know, temperature checks and things of that sort. So I think those things are going to stay around for, for a time to come, um, as I think they will just across the world in any industry, to be completely honest. Um, you know, I, I think during the pandemic too, we really leaned on technology. Um, we saw live streams really start to take off. I know Twitch did so much uh, in that time and how many artists were still trying to find a way to connect with fans. Um, I watched virtual festivals inside video games um, and people really try to take these concepts. And as technology, VR, AI, and all this really starts to advance, um, you know, the future, honestly, the future of music industry could be where you put on a VR helmet inside your living room and you go to the festival that way. Um, who knows? But uh, with where technology is heading and at the rate we're progressing, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule anything out at this point. I really think it depends on where you live in the world. Um, I, I think everywhere is going to be so different on, you know, the culture, the country, the city, whatever it is that you live in and just how they view the virus and the pandemic and, and such. Um, again, you know, here in Arizona, it's, it's really become more of an afterthought. And again, things are very normal and, uh, riding here. And I just, I know Europe and even the United States just handled everything so differently. Um, and just the response to it. Um, you know, I, I'm still waiting to see shows open up in other countries. I have places my artists still can't tour, um, which is really crazy. Um, but right now I think, yeah, things are, you know, seemingly returning to normal. Um, some of the biggest festivals, you know, we just had Lollapalooza here in Chicago that did so many attendees uh, across the board. And, you know, it just, it's a sense of normalcy is back. Yeah, uh, the music industry is a long, long journey. Um, it, it takes time. I think the number one thing anyone can teach themselves is patience, patience with themselves and patience with, you know, the process of getting into it. Uh, the number one thing that's always going to separate people is how much time they invest into themselves, uh, how much time they invest into their education, how much time they invest into their health. Um, you know, the sharper you can stay internally here, uh, the more you're going to be able to go and accomplish yourself uh, as you take on these hurdles that you're inevitably going to face that comes with the music industry. Uh, it, it's a very, very popular world to work in and a, a very high desired job. So you have to think of what are the things you're going to do that someone else isn't willing to do um, to separate yourself. And I, I think the number one thing I can really trace back to my early 20s and my process is I took a lot of time on self-development. I really learned to educate myself uh, on the industry as well as just on myself and focus on areas of self-development. Um, People always look for an outward solution when usually the solution we create is created within us. Um, so patience, work ethic, and create the solution within yourself to go and achieve what you want. Oh, yeah.